And I know Rob is going to be recording this, which is amazing. So we'll be happy to share this with folks if they'd like to uh, share this with some other folks and we'll promote it. Uh, we're calling this a Zoom speakeasy. The idea being since we're all shelter in place, shelter at home, um, the idea is via Zoom, we're all gonna get together after the main workday has ended and start talking about some really relevant topics. Um, particular today, we'd like to talk about weathering the storm of uncertainty. And what we've done is we actually have four featured speakers today, and each will be giving a three-minute pitch around a particular topic that they identified as something near and dear to their hearts. Um, the way this will work is, again, that we have a couple of slides. Uh, they'll talk through some ideas for a period not to exceed three minutes. And then during that, those uh, featured speaker remarks, we'd like to ask the folks on the phone if you have a question, if you have a point to make, if you'd like to rebut the, the point that they're making, um, or you'd like to just have your microphone unmuted, we'll ask you to go ahead and comment in the group chat and then um, at the completion of the three minute mark by the featured speaker, um, I will call on someone and ask you to go ahead and engage with the featured speaker for a period of two minutes. At the end of that two minutes, we'll go ahead and we'll move to the next featured speaker and we'll get through four featured speakers today. And at the end, you'll have an opportunity to send this particular group um, an email giving us feedback on today's speakeasy. If there's a question that you didn't get answered, if there's feedback that you have, uh, if you'd like to be a featured speaker on our next call, um, we'll give you the ways in which to do that. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Give me a moment and I will progress the slides. So first up, I'd like to call my esteemed colleague, Rich Miller. He's going to be talking about the nature of disruption, natural disaster versus willful attack. Sir, you may begin. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rich Miller. I run a small consultancy in Palo Alto. And I've been involved with the net since it began. I've gone through and probably have more scars and maybe a few battle ribbons as a result of dealing with uncertainty and the unintended consequences of my own actions. So what I'd like to do in kicking this off is thinking about, thinking out loud about, kind of a mindset. And one of the things I want to be clear about when we're talking this today about cloud and cloud infrastructure and disruption and uncertainty, I want to be clear that we really are not talking about black swans, the black swan theory where it's a metaphor that describes an event that comes as a real surprise, has a major effect, and then it's often inappropriately rationalized after the fact, you know, with the benefit of hindsight. Now, really, what I'm talking about here is better described as a gray rhino. Michelle Wooker introduced this term about seven years ago, in part to respond to uh, Nassim Taleb's book about the black swans. And she described gray rhinos as those highly probable, high impact, yet neglected threats. And the concept here was developed a little bit later in her book, and I would highly recommend you read it. And just as a note, I want you to know that the gray rhino is a close relative to the elephant in the room. So when considering infrastructure of any kind, but particularly service infrastructure, telecommunications, electricity, or information communication, compute technologies. Those of us who design, build, operate that infrastructure have to consider the obvious dangers. The obvious dangers, the ones that are recognizable, but which we often ignore, or even worse, the ones which we claim to be someone else's problem, someone else's responsibility. Many of these dangers can be anticipated because they can be forecast. Not predicted, they can be forecast. That means there are precursors, there are signals, 
that we should be that should be available to us and which we can get our arms around. So the mindset that I'm going to describe, if you go to the next slide, Amy, you got it. Um, is that of a an anticipatory thinker, and I'd like to also think about this as the kind of mindset that's required for design, planning, construction, operation is really that of a catastrophic thinker. It's a military strategist. It's a, it's a meteorologist. It's the script writer for a zombie apocalypse movie. This is the mindset and the skill set that's required of the anticipatory intelligence. And my claim, and I'll stand by it and defend it pretty heavily, is that there really are two types of catastrophes that we have to deal with. There's the natural or the unwilled disaster, and there's the willful attack. And they're taken from the outset in some very different ways. When you're anticipating a disaster that has no ill will behind it, it doesn't always have to be natural, by the way. In fact, it could include the unintended consequences of some other act. And there are even such things as success catastrophes. Um, if one's looking today at Zoom and their stock price, um, an unintended con uh, consequence of what we're dealing with now in the pandemic is in fact something of a success catastrophe they are dealing with an incredible, almost tenfold increase in users, traffic, and the like. In any case, these disasters, these catastrophes, these disruptions without ill will behind them, they're amenable to the discovery and the search for signals, for indicators, what we're thinking of as precursors. And the way you go about it is you look for historical evidence, you create methods of forecasting, and the means we address them in our designs is to design, build, test, 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 refine, rinse, and repeat. That seems to be the work, and you'll hear more about that in a few more minutes. What I'd like to also talk about is the willful attack. That is, these are the ones that are, in fact, somebody's ill will, intention, they want to take this and do damage. But you have to know the form of it. At the outset, you need to know if it's a ransom attack, if it's just disruption, if it's paralysis, is it destruction? On impact, with a catastrophe or, or a disruption that is without will, what you're concerned with is continuity, retention of control, and repair. With that willful attack, you have a different set of directives and those are the kinds of things that you need, not just continuity, it's survival, it's defense, and it's response. We're at pains to build our systems, our infrastructure, which we are now more dependent upon for both of those cases. And with that, I'll end and leave it open for questions. I think because we're a little bit behind schedule, I think we're going to move to the next speaker, if that's okay. Um, and I think I would encourage folks to, again, um, ask those questions in the chat. And if we don't, uh, aren't able to address them today, we will uh, follow up with you separately. So at this point in time, we'd like to introduce the next featured speaker, Mike Kyle, on strengthening your cloud infrastructure immune system. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, Mike Kyle, CTO of Everest.org. So we're a fintech startup uh, focused on 
uh, a combination of cloud identity and a cloud-based digital wallet, uh, working with emerging markets and central banks. Uh, so obviously, uh, cloud infrastructure and an immune system is um, of paramount importance to us. So Amy, you can go to the first slide. To segue from the, uh, the title of the, today's um, event, the first rule of uncertainty is about immunity. And immunity is not just the uh, resistance against something, but the ability to bounce back from it even stronger. So if you think about that being able to shore up your cloud infrastructure, uh, which will fail, but then being able to bring it back up stronger and more resistance to failure and continuing to build that over time. And go to the next slide. Um, and so some principles uh, around that, which um, uh, there's been a few startups around now is the principles of chaos engineering. So the kind of the four basic steps of that is identifying the components of your infrastructure and cloud architecture that are less resilient and start testing against them, injecting failure into those components, um, trying to prevent things such as cascading failures by having circuit breakers in, uh, making sure you measure what you're, being, what you're testing against and monitoring those outcomes, figuring out what are the weak points of the system and what you need to do to bolster the strength of that, uh, which means implement the means to increase resiliency and continue testing. The efforts of chaos engineering and, and bolstering your cloud's infrastructure immune system is always a work in progress. It's never done. There's always areas to improve. And if you're a company or entity delivering at a higher velocity, there's, the rate of change is always going to exceed your ability to test. But you want to try to narrow that gap as possible, uh, which, once again, increases your immune system. But I think the notion or the the initial legacy ways of thinking were you should always just prevent against failure and failure will never happen. Uh, and there's different architectures to, to do that. In cloud, you just assume that infrastructure is always going to be uncertain and fail. And it's a, it's a paradigm shift in your mental approach and your, and your testing approach. So uh, I will stop there trying to get us back on schedule a little bit and, and open up for questions. I think we have at least one, it looks like. Yep. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Cooney. Has a great question. If you want to go ahead, Lauren. Hey, how are you doing, Mike? Uh, um, one of the questions that I had was how should how should I look to start to inject chaos engineering principles into my team? Good question. So it's it's first about creating a uh, concise, cohesive plan, and communicating mm -hmm. that to your team, and then continuing to communicate or over communicate that because okay. there'll be a bunch of people that interpret it differently. They won't be sure if you really mean that it's okay for components to fail. Uh, if you combine that with like the blameless postmortem movements. So instead of finger pointing, like failures will happen, test against it. It's not bad. If you find a component that's less resilient, that's actually a good thing. And so you can fix that more quickly. So what I'm hearing is that you want to set expectations early that things are going to fail and bring in this new idea of and, and the pillars of chaos engineering like you just outlined right there. Is that correct? Yeah, failure is inevitable. It's not yeah. preventable. So exactly. just setting that context with them. So mm -hmm. you it, it's about removing the culture of fear from development as well. Yes, that's, that's what I was trying to get to right there is it is, it, so it is a bit of a cultural shift in there. It's a complete cultural shift because before it was like somebody would always be a scapegoat and mm -hmm. they get blamed or fired, but that wasn't helping strengthen your infrastructure and, and overall mm -hmm. platform or system. Fully agree. Great. Um, thanks so much for participating, Lauren. Mike, thank you so much. We will move along to, sorry about that, to our next speaker. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Rob Hirschfeld, who's going to be talking about increasing resilience through automation. Uh, thanks, Amy. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called RackN. Specializes on self-managed infrastructure automation. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the types of problems we've been talking about so far, and you know, really thinking about what the new normal will be for data center automation. We hear a lot of 
this default knee jerk. Everything's just going to move to the cloud. We're just accelerating the, the migration of, of all data centers basically being just Amazon's data center. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the, the way things actually need to go. And I'm not sure that it's actually a complete answer anyway. And so what we've been thinking about with new normal is, you know, looking at automation islands, which we see quite a bit of and, and trying to rethink of what it would look like to have really unbroken automation chains. And part of this is while it makes sense to move a whole bunch of automation into networked capabilities because people, you know, are remote working, it doesn't mean that we're going to get away from on premises or in situate in situ automation, right? The edge is still very real. Stores are real, you know, events are real, places where we want to put computing in location are real, offices, I think, are still real, even if nobody's in them. And so the new normal means that when we look at IT in those environments, we need to be thinking about it in a much more comprehensive way. Um, you know, the idea that you're going to travel to a remote site to, to do a configuration or send an IT tech to a place, um, I think that's going away. And I also think that the idea that you're going to be able to stick with a single vendor is also going away. There might be supply chain issues. You might have places where you want to reuse old gear. Um, we're, we've gotten really used to a, a 10 year boom where you would just buy new infrastructure and leave the old stuff running. And I, I think that that is not going to be the, the operating model. And so when we look at what's going on in this, it really comes down to thinking about how do we build resi resilient tooling that doesn't start with every new thing is a silo. Uh, how do we keep all those pieces connected? How do we, we allow these things to work so that if I can't get a laptop or a server, I can substitute another vendor that might be available or might be locally produced or might be in my closet but isn't being used effectively and I want to change it to a new, new function. I think that the new normal for, for post pandemic environments is really looking at that as a, um, as a very real thing. How do we be more efficient? When I think about what Rich said, you know, planning for a gray rhino means not, you know, always moving fast and breaking things, but coming back and saying, you know what, I actually need to make sure that I can repurpose my infrastructure or I can change vendors and being more careful. Uh, and that, that is a really big deal. Um, we've gotten used to this idea that I can just send a tech on an airplane in a day, have them go fix something and make it work. And we're all learning that that's not as easy as, it, as it, we thought it would be. And it, that entire ecosystem could be disrupted. So, you know, my thinking here is that we really need to look at, you know, really complete solutions that don't create a whole bunch of artificial boundaries um, like we've gotten used to doing and making up with people. So that was that was my thoughts for today. Great. Well, Rob, it looks like there's a couple of interesting questions. I'm going to um, read out two to you and you can you can pick uh, who you who you want to engage with. We've got uh, how do you implement self repairing automation? Um, our, or we have I would, I would, pandemic. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to call and pair. That would be great. All right, David, but we'll we'll get back to you. Per, do you want to ask the question and give some more background? I can. Un yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, and I was just thinking about because I read uh, the other book by uh, uh, not the Black Swan, but the uh, anti -fragile, fragile book that Rich referred to the same author from Lib Lebanon. I was just thinking about this how do you actually implement something like automation that it can recover or fix certain things because the automate, I work a lot with Kubernetes and uh, EKS, uh, GKE uh, and yeah. AWS and you have to do the automation quite, it's quite fragile. And I just wonder about ideas. How would you design something that's not so fragile to, to but you spend lots of time for automation to work and then it works for a while, but then it breaks. That's kind of the long question. No, I, what, what you're describing is something that to me, there's, there's three, buzzwords that, that are important to consider, right? One is continuous integration. Um, what we're actually looking at is continuously integrated data center. So being able to, to take those concepts all the way to the silicon, which then means you need immutable artifacts, you need infrastructure as code. Um, but if we want things that are less prone to breaking, we, we have to do them more. Um, other you know, infrequently changed stuff is what leads you to 
sending texts on site. So the faster we, we stress these systems on an ongoing basis back to chaos engineering, um, the, the less, the more resilient they become is the, the short answer. Good question. It's hard. And it Great. takes investment. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. All right, moving along. And by the way, these are great questions and love all the, the, uh, the questions and comments in chat. So please keep those coming. Um, next up, let's go with Mark Peely. He's going to be talking about defense in depth and rethinking edge priorities. Hi, folks. Uh, Mark Teeley, uh, CEO and founder of Edgevana. And I um, want to talk, look at uh, two different aspects of um, edge in relationship to providing defense for your company and um, you know, maintaining business continuity at some level. Um, and while the slide here focuses on the communication piece, I actually want to start with um, uh, something else and lead into it that is more infrastructure oriented. And it follows along a little bit with what Rob was saying. <clears throat> when we think about edge computing, when I think about edge computing, I should say, um, I consider it uh, the hand to the corporate body. Uh, and that's only going to become more and more so, in my opinion. So the hand to the corporate body, what, well, before Corona, what did we do with our hands? We reached out and touched in order to show warmth, trust, um, friendship, you name it, uh, any number of things that might come across, hatred, sliminess that might come across with a handshake. And so Edge, um, for all of its benefits, and there are many, uh, one of the biggest benefits is in being the extension of business transformation for a company and being the hand that touches the customer. And so when you think about deploying at the edge, uh, you have to think about both the scope and scale in relation to edge versus traditional core infrastructure. And most of the people that I talk to today, um, uh, at least a simple majority of the people that I talk to today um, are considering edge deployments, but they're considering them from the context of how do I take what I've been doing and somehow stretch it out over the edge. And uh, when you think that way, uh, when, and this gets to the point of defense, when you think that way, I think you set yourself up for failure because one, you're potentially putting in place uh, complexity and cost, going back to what Mike was saying as well, putting in complexity and cost that you can't effectively manage. Um, and you're putting in additional resources that reduce the availability of resource for everyone else at the edge. And I firmly believe that we will create an enormous demand for infrastructure and capacity at the edge. So we have to be wise about the best way to use that infrastructure. So in short, when you think about the edge, you need to think about, no, I don't need air conditioning. I don't need extra power supplies. I don't need batteries. I don't need a truck roll. In fact, if I do need a truck roll, the truck roll is gonna be a DHL driver who is certified as a mechanic on my boxes. And they're gonna be able to drop a disk drive or a new um, chassis into a, a remote controlled box and that box is gonna drop it into a robot and that robot is gonna place it where it needs to be in a rack. Um, and so you, if you're not thinking that way and you're not thinking about that way from a security standpoint, from a, from a, um, a, a, man, a remote management standpoint uh, and from a, a hardening of the infrastructure deploying standpoint, then I think you fail before you start. Uh, and so um, both what Mike and um, I mean, in fact, what everybody has said aligns I think with that very well but specifically what Mike and Rob have just said are key components of thinking about how to build out for the edge. Lastly, and really quickly, um, uh, I found through many years of working to um, deploy uh, infrastructure for folks uh, in companies from HP to VMware to Brocade and others, that one of the single most important things in disaster planning and business continuity has nothing to do with all the cool big tech. It has to do with communications. And if in fact you believe anything I've said about the edge becoming the hand to the corporate body for, the, for reaching out and touching the customer, then when you have a failure at the edge, when there is a disaster that causes you to have a failure at the edge, you've lost your access to the customer and that access is immediate. Like the impact people feel now when something like uh, Zoom uh, is unavailable or something like Facebook is unavailable uh, or Google search is unavailable, they are considered uh, the equivalent of air now. And when they're unavailable, we notice immediately. So considering how that communication plays a, a critical part in ensuring that your customers recognize that you're alive and haven't um, forsaken you or believe you've forsaken them in the course of some problem uh, is critical to um, figure out a way to accommodate that communication regardless of what's going on at the edge 
uh, and ensure your customers don't feel that uh, you've become a black hole uh, after some localized or national disaster. So with that, uh, uh, I'll wrap up and just say that um, uh, communication um, and rethinking how you deploy, uh, uh, a la points made by Mike and Rob and um, Rich, uh, are critical to success in being able to manage complex infrastructure uh, during the course of a failure uh, that resembles something like the coronavirus. Great. I apologize. We are uh, at the, 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 towards the, the end of it, and I've, of course, picked a, an opportune moment to have some, some screen issues. <laughs> but um, hopefully everyone is able to, to kind of see um, the, uh, the final slide, which is, you know, thanking everyone for joining today. Um, obviously, if anybody has any feedback for any of the featured speakers, um, if you have any uh, additional questions or comments, or you'd like to be a featured speaker in a future Zoom speakeasy, um, there's an email address that you all can actually email, and we'd be happy to take those. Um, we do have about two more minutes. Unfortunately, my, my, uh, my screen share is completely frozen, so you got to love tech. But uh, with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Rob. I know he's going to pick uh, if anybody has a question from the group um, by raising their hand in the Zoom. Uh, we can go ahead and answer those at this time. And we will be scheduling more of these in the future. So Rob, let me turn it over to you to take anybody who raises their hand with a question or a comment uh, from the group. Uh, certainly. And I'm happy to open it up for people who had questions that we didn't get to if you want to come back and, and ask questions. Um, Please just raise your hand or um, I think. John, did you have a question? Yeah. I'm going to let you all unmute yourself, though. If most people are muted right now. You have the power. John, hey, did. okay. So, Steve, um, Steve here. Uh, how's everybody? Very good. Thank you. Great. The law of unintended consequences, me being able to connect with Rich after at least what, Rich, 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, about 20 years. By the way, I ran into Dan Blum and uh, Gary Rowe at RSA about a month ago in San Francisco. All right, uh, a couple of quick observations for you guys. Uh, first of all, just a, a little quick, uh, super quick story. I had a client that ran one of the largest telecommunications networks in the world. Rich, I think you might know who this guy was. He had a tattoo on his arm that said, the best I can do is not fail. <laughs> and so, you know, to the point of chaos engineering and you know the, the hardening of things. And I think we're all gonna learn it right now. There's gonna be a whole new area coming out called quarantine grade, right? Imagine what it <laughs> takes to engineer and to spec out quarantine grade uh, operations. So that's my little uh, uh, input. Really cool to be here. Rich, good to see you, buddy. I hope to catch up with you. Give me a call. This is for Mark, real quick. Um, am I muted? Can you hear me? Nope, you are, you are talking. Oh, oh great. <laughs> Hello, Mark. Hello. Um, um, quick question. Um, it took a while, and you, you walked me through this, um, getting to know the edge and, and understanding what, where it really sits in, you know, in the final, in the greatest sphere of things. Um, why is it so hard for people to understand that, and what can we do to get everybody to understand that this is such a critical component? especially with all the inputs coming in or, and what we expect to come in over the next uh, few years, that we really have to watch it and we have to harden it in order to uh, build, uh, to have it be more resilient. And uh, I'll go off, um, I think it's Lane, what he said about quarantine grade. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And um, there, it's, there's a multifold answer. Um, uh, this is a topic that specifically Rob and I talk about a lot, but uh, um, all of us on the phone and others talk about this a lot. And part of it is an education thing. Um, another part of it is a combination of, um, of mixed standards and deployment models. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, vendors that are trying to make a stake and make a claim for what is edge because it drives value for them if they do, right? So, uh, and this is not to take away from anyone. People have great solutions, that isn't the issue. But if you think about somebody like AWS and Outpost calling it Edge, right? Um, I don't know about anybody on the on the call here, but everything that Outpost is 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 actually tethered on-premises IT. <laughs> it. Has nothing to do with Edge. Now, 
Does that mean that they couldn't make it edge at some point? They couldn't make those multi-tenant uh, and somehow connect them between um, locations of enterprise data centers and co-location facilities? No, they could, but it's just on-premises IT that is operated and run by uh, AWS. Another version of edge is somebody putting uh, IOT in a, in a manufacturing facility uh, and managing against failure and managing against risk to injury of people, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in real time, because that's what's needed. Um, so it runs the gamut. And, and the, the part of edge that I enjoy talking about the most uh, and where the definition I think is most required is the eventual opportunity that I see edge representing from a marketplace standpoint. And to me, the opportunity of, of edge becoming a marketplace would look something similar to the way, um, uh, you know, some of us could get on, a, on, on our machines over the weekend, write an app and deploy it on um, the iPhone store. When we reach the point where we can deploy an app that goes nationally, internationally, or semi-regionally, whatever it is you determine is appropriate based on your, your ability to pay, that you can deploy with a common set of APIs and a common access point to almost anywhere in the world. Uh, for pennies an app, um, because you're likely to only get pennies from the average customer that used that app, similar to an Android phone app or an Apple phone app. So in my in my book, long term, that's what I see as a marketplace for the edge. But underneath that, and then above that, the business models are literally in the millions. Um, thanks. And just a quick follow up. I'm sorry to take up so much time. Uh, where does analytics and all that data collected uh, come into being when it comes to the edge? Well, I'll, would I'll take it, a stab at that, but I'm sure edge? other, yeah, uh, I'm sure would other people would be able to. Or would it be consumed in the cloud? No, that's the, that's the thing. I mean, uh, the, the simple answer, John, is that um, there's going to be, in most cases, there's going to be too much data created at the edge. Regardless mm -hmm. of latency concerns, there's going to be too much data created at the edge to centralize it. So the, the, the question becomes moot, not because of desire, not because of assumption, but because of a reality of bandwidth availability. Um, and uh, happy to go into detail about how that bandwidth is impacted, but I've talked to several large scale um, box stores um, and um, uh, food companies, et cetera, that are doing edge in their stores. And the reason they're doing edge in their stores has a little bit to do with latency in some cases, especially where they're trying to do VR training and stuff like that. But in many cases, they determined that they had no choice but to do edge in their stores because they were creating too much data to ship it anywhere else. It was just that simple. <laughs> I'm, so. I'm laughing because it's, it's just, that's just IT. Yep. I, right, right. We're putting edge on it. It's a marketing name, but it, what we're saying is, is that we're, we've made it possible to do IT on premises again. That's all edge. Edge is just reclaiming on premises or in situ IT. Right. Um, and, well, you know, but it's, yeah. so that, is a, that is a huge volumes of data. At, at the edge, right? On what factor we are splitting the data between the edge and cloud? What's the oh, basic? That, I don't know that anybody knows that. I think that there will be some uh, some amount of data that's identified via tools, AI or or other um, uh, data segregation or governance tools uh, for capture for long term trending, um, financial systems, or something like that. But generically speaking, um, the the value of the edge will be in immediacy. Um, the value of being able to manage the data locally will be in cost and in, in, in reality in the, uh, the question of whether or not you can even deploy, because if your assumption is that you have to be able to put it back to the cloud, then in many cases, you just won't be able to deploy. Um, so in that environment, latency actually becomes a byproduct success uh, rather than the driving success for many of those apps. But I think that one thing that, that should be called out here, though, is there are some differences in the edge as defined today versus how branches were handled in the past, right? Sure. So um, we are talking about, in, as we've increased the scale of centralized data center computing, we're now talking about in, greatly increasing the scale of what we run in edge locations. I mean, we're talking about collecting, as you say, massive amounts of data from many, many more sensors than we uh, ever would have put in a re say a retail store or a warehouse. Um, we're talking about um, using requiring software to do many more functions that would have been done by people one way or another than was done in the past. So I think 
I think it's a, you know, I, it's, I, it's not wrong to say that, hey, we're, you know, this is just the evolution of IT in, you know, in these situations that are common. Maybe for some, you know, there are a couple of industries where maybe it's now a little bit less common than it was. Um, you know, I'd give an example of, yes, insurance brokers had software to, you know, to do quotes, but how many insurance, you know, how many insurance companies had to worry about how they were going to collect uh, data from all of these in-car sensors that are measuring um, people's driving habits, right? So it, 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 this is what I think is really interesting about this is that we're watching a natural progression. I was talking to Mark about this just the other day. Uh, of uh, We're not watching a natural evolution of a complex adaptive system that has something that flows through it, in this case, data. And if you read Jeffrey West's book, Scale, very naturally, it's going to evolve into, you know, a trunk, limb, branch leaf kind of shape and we're watching the limbs start to thicken up here we've we watched the trunk really get bigger and stronger and i think we're watch, watching the limbs get bigger um and last thing i'll say about this is uh, christian riley has a great term that i'd love to see grow in the lexicon that he talks about for those sets of software that are highly interdependent in a sub domain like an edge computing location and he calls it micro clustering and I, I like that idea that you'll have hubs of data activity around a new data gravity element that's at an edge location instead of central. And that, that you will have a shape that'll look a lot like what our data centers were dealing with, say, in the late 90s, early 2000s, before web scale really became a thing. So anyway. Yeah. James, Ooh, it, would, those, would those micro clusters also have as a property the ability to continue to operate and at least for some period of time provide service to their clientele. That's a continuity argument, even though they are, that cluster is disconnected temporarily from yeah, I don't think there's their a, peers. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great, I, I think that there are many use cases where that would be a goal that could be accomplished with this is the way I would answer it. Yeah. I don't know that that's a part of the definition. But, um, but absolutely, I would use personally, knowing what I know now, 30 years into this little game, I would absolutely use a micro clustering concept if I had a use case problem where I had, say, a, a, you know, a giant target store or a set of giant target stores um, connected to a single distribution center that um, I needed to coordinate massive amounts of data um, mm -hmm. just there in that little network before I sent some aggregated information out of that back to the central um, headquarters for, for computation. Right, right. That's I I think it's, there's nothing new about that, right? Because if we go back to... Nothing you know, new. World, yep. Nothing new. IBM SNA, remember System 34, System sure. 36? Absolutely. I mean, the What's hottest the box in a retail store. Why? Sub-second response time. That's all you care about. What I what I think the real differential boils down to, other than the ability to operate without the internet, is the privacy of the data, the intimacy of the data required to apply artificial intelligence is limiting the ability of that data to be accessed, not just because of bandwidth and latency and getting it to the inference and getting the answer back, but because of privacy because people say i don't want you to have every single detailed bit of information about the operation of my aircraft engine i only want you to have enough information in order to generate the bill for me to pay for the leasing of that aircraft engine i don't want you to know you know what and, the altitudes and, were that i flew at etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's why i'm the old guy that teased the other old guy over here rich in the in the linkedin thing i mean we figured this out, okay, 30 years ago. Now, it didn't happen, okay, but the construct of administrative domains and private domains that could control that security, literally down to the content level, and allow you to say what could flow back and forth between governments, trading partners, individuals, what have you. There was an architecture that was built, right? And Rich and I spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to get people to do this thing. And then open happened as it should have happened. And then, you know, off it went, right? But it was, it was, it was heavyweight, heavyweight. to say the least. And, Badass. And un, un, unrealistic, not pragmatic, but 
it went it had the right intention Steve. it was designed it really by telephone companies and postal <laughs> services okay yeah but, but from an engineering right. perspective the architecture is there and uh anyway i just it's yeah. uh it, the pendulum and, and, swings right it goes back and forth yeah you and think, David, david's you, one of david's think, point. Uh, sorry do you think this would allow um for the creation of new i guess data models right where a lot of this information is really superfluous to operations right um you don't need to know on a very granular detail you know two bathrooms were flushed 33 seconds apart right you probably need to know how much water you're using um do, well, do let me give you, you a, i'm sorry let me give you a really brief example okay um, i did a project at ibm where i have video cameras over, all over my property including in my bathroom okay and um, i could not put one in the bathroom until I ran the AI on the camera in the bathroom and no video ever left the camera in the bathroom. So my user experience, my end user acceptance criteria was one that that will not happen as long as you're sending that information, even on the local area network, right? That was the edict from above. <laughs> the second thing that I observed was again according to latency and things like that if you depend upon someone else's definition of what you're inferencing over you end which is part of edge computing is doing moving the ai to the data you also can't solve problems like my wife's name is spelled k-e-l-i and ibm's watson pronounces that as keely leading my wife to say, if that machine ever calls me Keely again, I'm tearing it off the wall. <laughs> and my complete inability to change that AI model to reflect the pronunciation of that, and instead having to go change the spelling of her name in the system to have two versions, one which I use for text display and one which I fed to that moronic piece of software called Watson. So. <laughs> But to if you me, that's it. edged together. Those two <laughs> things together. You've got to have that private, intimate ability to collect data, and you've got to have the ability to act on it in a way that alleviates the end user's unwillingness to let their private, proprietary, sensitive, intimate data be sent somewhere. Because who knows where it goes once it leaves the bathroom. So that's, the main challenge is, is <laughs> edge is <laughs> out there. This so, is the, the Zoom yeah, dilemma you know, of the year. What example you said about, about, you know, your pronunciation and, you know, what the AI reads out about your wife. Um, how, do you, how do you then account for biases? Is, is, your, is, your, is your data set very, very small? Bias is good. Right? Bias is good. I want bias because but at bias, the end of the day, bias, bias, end of the day at the end of the day, okay. My AI serves my end user. If my end user is biased, uh -huh. then I want my AI to be biased the way they want it to be biased. What if your AI is a country that is dead set on abusing the civil rights of its citizens? Right. Then they better be able to run my AI on that whole AI on a Jetson Nano. By that, I mean that the objective function can be defined by anyone for any goal-seeking algorithm, right? What I'm trying to do is design my goal-seeking algorithm to address the needs of an end-user community. And if that end-user community wants what is typically viewed as a cat to be recognized as a dog, because that's what they want it recognized is, then that is what my AI should accommodate, right? That's what I should train for. That's the edge case in AI. I think right? that's really that's, mm -mm. Mm -mm. I think that's really I, I agree with that. As, so, as, a, as a member of a, of a generally um, 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 biased against minority, I, I think that's, that's ridiculous. Not you personally, but I, I think that's a ridiculous point of view because I've seen it work in adverse, adverse, uh, adverse, uh, in adverse situation, not just in the United States, in the UK, and in countries in Africa, all around. 
because the no, AI, you're, you're, right? you're, 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 you're talking about someone building a generic AI and expecting it to cover all the edge cases, right? I'm okay. looking at the inverse problem. Where it's hyper specific. Right? My, my edge cases are what I want the AI to do that it doesn't do out of the box. I appreciate for example, it. for example, if I walked into a room and it said, I don't recognize you as a person, right? I want to give that AI a little slap in the back of the head and say, no, I am a person. Recognize me as a person, right? And that could have been a failure on the part of the original AI developer. It could be because I'm abnormal looking, but whatever the case might be, that's the expected objective function that I want the AI to be trained for. That's the edge case which the generic AI is pilloried whenever it makes a mistake because it's never trained on all the edge cases, right? It's only trained on the whatever it is, 6,000 different classifications in the COCO data set, right? So what do you think so, so wait, about wait, identity? Hold, hold. Hold, hold on, because we're 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 down we're down a we're, we're coming we're coming down to a place, and one of the reasons why we wanted the conversations to have a chance to have sort of the we started with this three minute format. We're, we're identifying a topic that we want to hear from people about, and the the I, when we when we talked about putting the speaking together, one of the things we wanted was a chance for people to to have a reasoned position and, and state it, and then have pros and cons and be able to come back. You know, what I think we're, we're finding is an area for a discussion topic um, that we want to have, have ongoing, and that's exactly what we want to be able to do. That's how we wanted to structure this. It's why we didn't open the mics up before we had a chance to sort of get, get the conversation seated. Um, and I would love, to, I would love to, to have this and say, come in and, and you know, put together a case and, and make, a, make a point. Um, I think that's, I'm, I'm speaking for my initial, all, all the initial speakers on this, but that was what, what we were hoping for. We want a spirited debate, um, but not just between two people. We want it to be, be how, how you're going. I believe in what Rob said for no other reason than pretty much all of us, except maybe Mike would talk for hours if you let us. <laughs> I was going to say, unless of course you have me nagging at you to move on. So there's that. Right, right. I've been but, speaking um, on mute, Mark. You just didn't oh, want to say what I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, what I, but what I would suggest is, again, you know, if you guys have thoughts and comments, uh, the email address I gave to everybody um, that's in the Zoom chat, that was on the bottom of the slides. So I'm happy to put it up again. Um, that will go to the four featured speakers plus myself. And we'll be working to organize the next one on um, timing TBD, uh, but, but looking for, again, feedback, uh, feedback on today's content, um, other topics you'd like us to look into. If there's a particular featured speaker, whether it's yourself or someone else, just let us know. We'll be happy to look at that. But please send those notes into us. Um, you know, if folks want to continue this on a regular basis and there's an appetite for it, we'll be very happy to do that. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry if I took, a, I took us off trail. I apologize. No, let's no, have no, this conversation. No, further. there's no apologies in the speakeasy. There's no apologies are allowed. Did you see the sign on the wall of the speakeasy? It's, there's <laughs> no apology sign. It's so like with that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> with that, I would just say, you know, thank you again to our featured speakers, um, Rich, Rob, Mike, and Mark. Really appreciate it um, for all of you on the um, the uh, the Zoom chat joining in. Um, there was a lot of work that went into this for the first one. I'm looking forward to doing this again. So please, even if it's just, you know, good, I enjoyed it, please send us that. Again, we're looking for a commentary on how to keep this valuable to everyone and on the topics that you guys would like to do. So again, thank you so much for joining all four of us. Really appreciate it. I hope everybody uh, stays safe. I uh, hope your families feel well and healthy and we'll look forward to doing this again with everyone. So thank you again so much and everybody have a great evening. Very cool, you too, bye-bye. Take good care, everyone. Bye, thanks.